So today's speaker is Brody Dunn. Brody is a visiting extension outreach associate focused on pollinators and beneficial insects. We're really looking forward to your presentation, Brody, so I will turn it over to you. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right. All right, everyone, thank you for the introduction. My timer start restarted here. Um, I guess without further ado, we'll we'll get started here. Tricky pollinator questions and answers. Um, Aaron, you're, you're did the introduction. I can skip a slide. Uh, so first, I'm I'm going to tell you where these questions are from. Uh, then I'm going to tell you the the questions, and then I'm going to tell you the answers. But they're going to be kind of silly answers. Um, uh, we're going to go back. We're going to address each question individually. We're going to explore the science. We're going to revisit that original kind of silly question or silly answer but now with this added context. Then we'll try to get to some of these uh, pre-submitted questions that you guys uh, submitted to us. And if we have time, uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end. All right. Um, all right, so where are these questions from? Well, they're requests from educators. And uh, you know, I've only been at Extension for a little under a year and our, our Extension educators are pretty bright folks. And uh, you know, they, they managed to do just fine answering pollinator questions before I was here. Um, that means that they can answer most pollinator questions. And when they, they forward these questions to me, it's usually for a really good reason, right? So it, it's sometimes it's, it's, a tr it's tricky because it has lots of exceptions and caveats. It's complicated, it's difficult to uh, sort through. Sometimes there's conflicting science. Right, so so one scientist says one thing, one scientist says another. They say, Brody, who's telling the truth? Uh, sometimes it's a new issue and there's incomplete understanding, right? So it's so new that science has not had enough time to sort of chew through it, right? So we have an incomplete understanding. All right, so here's the questions and their answers, right? And these, these are kind of knee-jerk, silly answers, right? So. Question one, does it help pollinators to not mow my lawn? It depends. Question two, are cultivars of native plants pollinator friendly? Maybe. Question three, are monarch butterflies an endangered species now? Yes, and also no. Question four, does rearing monarchs help their population? No, but you should still do it in some cases. All right, question five, are my annual plants junk food for pollinators? Probably not, except in some specific cases. And then question six, can I help pollinators if I can't garden or don't own land? Yes, and the way that doesn't need a garden can have just as much or more of an impact. All right, so let, let's look at these can, uh, questions in more depth. So does it help pollinators to not mow my lawn? This is a question, it's a recurring question that Extension gets starting in March, going through April, running through about mid-May. And it's all because of one program. It's called No Mo May. But what's No Mo May? No Mo May is a program run through the Xerxes Society, part of their Bee City USA initiative. And it started in the UK by another organization. I think it was called Plant Life. And this, this is important later, and you'll find out why. It's seen, since Xerxes Society has taken it over, it's seen increasing popularity, especially in the Northeast, in the upper Midwest. And well, what is it? Well, it's just what it says on the tin. Don't mow during the month of May. Don't mow during May. That's what it, that, that's what it is. There's a few other little things in there, but that's, that's really the gist of it. And it's sort of predicated on this notion that well, actually a lot of these things that we consider to be weeds in our lawns, pretty good pollinator plants. Clover especially, clover's a, a real good pollinator plant, right? And maybe, maybe if we, don't mow these down that'll provide some floral resources during this critical early spring period, right? But there's some problems with no mow May. One has to do with the growing season. I said they started in, in the UK and that it's got popular in the Northeast and upper Midwest. Well, in these locations, if you don't mow during the month of May, grass gets pretty tall, it gets pretty tall. But if you don't mow in Illinois during in May, which is much further south, it gets really tall, really tall. Maybe not quite this tall. This is now, I think this is an alfalfa field, but it gets so tall it can cause problems, right? So your grass might need two passes, right? 
where it's really tall, it might get yellow underneath, right? Where, where the top of it, of the canopy is, is blocking the sun, the bottom. And theoretically, and this is issues that other extension units had to deal with, other extension agencies, it might be costly if you have somebody come mow your lawn for you, or it might harm your equipment, right? And this is a relatively minor concern, I think, I think. One of the other one issues that we run into is actually the city code. So lawn height is really tightly regulated in most cities. And in fact, it's so tightly regulated, you know, th this image, you know, why am I showing you the city of Salisbury, North Carolina, right? Well, I went to a public domain image search engine and I typed in no mo may lawn, right? And I found a lawn that looked really great. It was very clearly part of participating in no mo may. I clicked on it and it redirected me to the city of Salisbury's code department, right? So clearly this is probably used as like an example of what not to do or something like that, right? But the thing about these, it's really tightly regulated, lawn height is, um, and it's also complaint enforced, right? So maybe you have a dinner party with some neighbors and you and two or three neighbors decide you're gonna do no mow May. And you know it's, it's halfway through May and you guys haven't mowed and someone down the road, some neighbor that, that's not on board, hasn't heard about no mow May, sees that you haven't mowed your lawn in two weeks. And they, they call up the city and they say, oh my God, you're not gonna believe how tall this lawn is. It's crazy, there's snakes, there's deer, it's all these terrible things, right? And then the city has to send their, their landscaping enforcement uh, uh, employee out to give you a ticket, right? And five or six people do this in a city and it causes problems during May, right? But back to the question. Uh, but those are just problems with no mome. Let's go back to this original question. You'll recall I said, well, it depends. Well, it depends. What's it depend on? It depends on, well, one, your neighbors in your city, if they're going to be sort of tolerant of having a, a tall lawn. It also depends on what's in your in your lawn. So if you'll recall a couple slides back, we we had these two images of and sort of using them as an example of, well, this is what an unmowed lawn looks like. But I kind of lied. That's not necessarily unmowed lawn. In fact, one of them I think it's just the edge of a forest. So I lied on that one. Apologies. But the bottom one here is, is, is definitely a, um, somebody who is participating in no mow may. But the thing is they've gone out and they purposefully seeded their lawn with uh, a bee lawn mix, right? So it's got a ton of, of, it's a really dense mix that you toss out and it, all these clovers grow up, right? It's purposefully intentfully seeded ahead of May to make this uh, as valuable as it, as it can be to resources or to uh, pollinators. But the thing is that most lawns don't look like this. Most lawns look more like this, right? I mean, so most lawns have a, a couple flowers in them, but um, you know, a lot of lawns, and especially in urban spaces, do actually just look like this. And if your lawn looks like this, you're not really helping pollinators by growing it out, because it's just grass. You're not offering any floral resources. But there's, there's a little asterisk on that, which, well, it actually, it does kind of help with air pollution because uh, gasoline powered lawn and garden equipment is shockingly pollu uh, pollutant. Um, it makes a pretty substantial impact on air quality. In fact, I, these lawn and garden tractors and weed whackers and so forth account for, uh, let's see, have it in my notes here, half of non-road emissions. So not, not including cars, but half of non-road emissions and 5% of total air pollution. And this is especially because of things like weed whacker, these two stroke engines, right? So theoretically you get enough people in the city doing this, not mowing, you can actually probably have a measurable impact on air pollution, right? But th this is sort of, th this is very abstract. It's a little farther away from, from pollinators than we intended to go, right? And I, ju I just wanna have a little bit of an aside here to say that if you go to, to one of those public domain search, uh, search engines, you type in like public domain lawn, you get one lawn in particular. And luckily this served our purposes, right? It's just that most people don't have a Hercules helicopter and a Mo Washington monument in their lawn. All right, but moving on, moving on. Um, so if you participate in this, I highly recommend that you talk to your neighbors first. Um, and even if they get on board, I highly recommend you put in buffers. So on the, on the far right, uh, right hand side here, you can see the university has put a buffer around a no mo area. And a lot of times city code actually requires that. Um, and it, I would also recommend that you read your city's code to make sure you're not gonna get a surprise like $500 ticket in case somebody complains, right? 
consider mowing once halfway through May, because really this should be no mow April in our area, in our growing zone. It, it, that's just more what would make sense. But if you're doing going to do no mow May specifically, then you should probably mow at least once just to avoid the issues of the tall grass. And if you can plant one of those um, high density uh, flowering mixes, these B-Lon flowering mixes. Uh, if I if I thoroughly put you off of, of no mow May, then there are other options you can explore. There are no mow and low mow turf replacements you can use. They have sedges and that kind of thing. Um, you can also reduce your mowing schedule theoretically. This could help some, uh, some of those clover come out. Uh, I also think it would be great if you could do an early flowering pollinator garden. That would also be helpful if you're really trying to get uh, help to pollinators in this early spring period. All right, so does it help pollinators to not mow my lawn? It depends. Well, it depends on what your yard looks like and is relying upon what your city, neighbor, city and neighbors will tolerate. If your goal is to support pollinators in the early spring, there might be better options. And there's another little caveat here, which is to say that if your city adopts the program, honestly, I, I would just go for it because there's positive impact. It's not hurt, hurting anything, right? Even if your lawn only has a couple of floral resources, only has a couple of clover in it, it's probably not hurting anything to let it grow tall, right? Um, and maybe it, it will uh, help uh, with those couple of flowers, right? If the city is going for it, that means that you're probably not going to get a ticket, right? All right, question two. Are cultivars of native plants pollinator friendly? And I said, maybe. Um, and we're going to breeze through this one pretty quickly. And that's because it's a really new issue. And we have a very incomplete understanding of it. You know, people have only been really putting uh, native plants in the sort of home landscape that, that's really not been popular for very long. There aren't many cultivars out there quite yet, right? And so science hasn't caught the eye of scientists yet. So there's still, work has not yet been completed on this. But we do have some evidence that certain features may matter, specifically flower color. So on the left here, you have a, a purple cone flower, and it, that's just the wild type, the straight species. But then we have on the right, a cultivar, and it has this kind of green tint to it and this sort of soft white. And pollinators probably won't see this flower quite as well as they will see the straight species. Because they'll, they'll look at this and they'll say, oh, well, that's just a weird leaf, and they'll fly away, right? So there's some issues if you change the flower color too much. And flower form also matters. So th this in particular is hot papaya uh, variety. It's, it's also, uh, purple coneflower, but it's a double flowering variety. And this, this variety probably doesn't produce pollen, but even if it does, um, and, and it, even if it does produce a bunch of nectar, it's inaccessible to pollinators, right? So th this is probably, you, you have to keep an eye on these weird flower forms, right? It may also be the case that leaf color matters. So a lot of these varieties have uh, changed the leaf color. Now, and on the, in the center here, you have a, a a regular nine bark, just a wild type nine bark. And on the right, you have something, uh, a variety that has uh, red leaves. And the, the red is from anthocyanins. I forget what class of chemical that is, but it's not good for caterpillars. And it's not good for these other herbivorous insects. So they eat less of the leaves. So it's less nutritious, essentially. And on the left, you have a variety that more or less has less chlorophyll. And they found that in var variegated varieties, actually more of the plant will get eaten by herbivorous insects, which of course, the, uh, the, this includes Lepidopteran, so it includes butterfly, uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars, right? So more of it will actually get eaten, but it's not getting eaten because it like tastes better. It's getting more of it is getting eaten because it's less nutritious, and so they have to eat more of it, right? So it, it is doing a worse job of supporting pollinators in that way. So that's something we have to keep, yet yeah, maybe have to keep an eye on. But the thing is that this is so new that these rules have not necessarily been proven to be universal. And it, that's really unfortunate because that means that if we can't find these sort of universal traits and we can't come, it means that we have to evaluate these on a case by case basis, which is horrible. That, that's, that would be really unfortunate. So this is something to keep an eye on. So are cultivars of native plants pollinator friendly? Maybe. Cultivars of native plants may have traits that make them worse for pollinators. The science is still very preliminary. It seems like there are identifiable traits which can be avoided to retain those positive attributes, but it may also be the case that varieties will have to be evaluated uh, one at a time. Uh, in the absence of informed guidance, 
it's probably better to choose wild type plants, specifically if you are gardening um, for pollinators. So if you really like the plant, you know, go for it. If you're, but if you're trying to garden specifically for pollinators, probably a good idea to choose a wild type. And I've got a, a, just like with most of my, my answers here, I, I had a little asterisk, which is that there is some concern from some scientists that there will be gene flow moving from these weird cultivars into the wild populations. And the thing about cultivars that we put into our garden is that, well, they, they kind of need our help to survive. So they're not as good at surviving out in the wild. So that means if you have a cultivar and it sends its genes, you know, some pollen from one of these cultivars, makes it out into the wild population, the wild population could theoretically be less fit because of that. And we don't have any evidence of this yet, but it is something that science, I've heard scientists talk about. So that's just something to keep on the radar. All right, question three. Are monarch butterflies an endangered species now? I said yes, but also no. Let's look into that. If you ask the US Fish and Wildlife Service, they will say we're thinking about it. If you ask IUCN, they'll say, yes, we just added it, added it to the red list. So who's IUCN? IUCN is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They're an interna international organization headquartered in Switzerland. They do a lot of great work. In fact, I think IUCN is the largest um, largest conservation organization in the world, do a lot of awesome work. I, I think they have an advisory seat on the UN even. Um, but they have this threatened species ranking called the Red List. And you have almost certainly interacted with this Red List before, because if you go to Wikipedia, it's this. It's this, it's this uh, conservation status that they have on most common species and most well-known species, right? So that, that's, you've almost certainly interacted with their Red List before. In July of 2022, IUCN added the monarch to their red list, and it's specifically the migratory subspecies, because there's a, a non-migratory population that lives in, I think, Central and South America, and also on islands, I believe. But the, the uh, migratory subspecies is the one that we deal with. Uh, it's the one that we see in Illinois. Uh, let's see, here we go. So what does this mean? What is, what is getting listed by IUCN mean? Well, they don't have any regulatory power. They have no regulatory power. And their classification confers no legal protections for species that they've classified as endangered. But their classification does shine a really big light on the species. You know, it's a big flashlight right on them. And it makes other conservation organizations say, well, well maybe we should, we should look at this. Maybe we should spend some money on this. And it makes governments look at that like, OK, maybe we need to look at the species to, to see if it needs to be listed. Right. So they're not they're not powerless. They're not they, they just they have a purpose and they, they serve their purpose well. Right. Well, let's look at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're in charge. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is in charge of assessing species for protection under the Endangered Species Act. And this is the like when you hear people talking about the Endangered Species Act in the United States, this is what they're talking about. This is the act. Right. And there's a process to get listed on the uh, under this. Um, legislation. Uh, first, you have to petition. You petition to get a species listed. And if the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, thinks it's merited, they'll do an assessment. And they'll issue that assessment for comment. And then they'll make a decision based on the assessment and the comments that they've gotten. And if they have an affirmative finding, then that does uh, confer legal protections. And a lot of them, this is a very powerful law. It confers a lot of protections. In September of 2020, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service issued their species status assessment report for the monarch butterfly. And they had a finding of warranted but precluded. So what is that? Well, warranted but precluded means that it, they think it might need to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. It might, it might be threatened, it very well might be endangered, but they don't currently have the resources or, or some other reason, they, for some other reason, they can't list it right now. And they're going to throw it into a into a process where they have to redo this every year, and so they'll they'll keep reevaluating until they come to a, a decision as to whether it should or should not be listed. Now, theoretically, they're supposed to do this every year, but they they're not doing it every year because they're really behind. There's a lot of species that they have to consider, and they're pretty underfunded, right? So it is rumored that they're going to get to the back to the monarch later this year or perhaps early next year. 
And that's not for sure, that's just a rumor, but that's what I've heard. So we might be able to revisit this pretty soon. So our monarch butterflies, and oh, excuse me, sorry, wait a minute. So what does the science say? Well, that report that they issued said that the probability of extinction is between 48 and 69% in the next 60 years. That's with current conditions. If conditions worsen, so if climate change gets worse, if we use more land, uh, convert more um, grassland into agriculture, if we use more pesticides and more herbicides, then the probability of extin extinction raises to between 56 and 74% over the next 60 years. There has been more science that has occurred on the monarch since they've released this report. And the new science says that this species is extremely, extremely resilient. They're very resilient. So what happens, what this um, paper has found is that, well, the species leaves Mexico and they have these reduced numbers in Mexico, right? This is where they overwinter and they, they basically explode out into the United States and they totally, almost completely and entirely recover, right? They get almost up to what last year's numbers were. And then in the fall, as they come back down, going back down and fall uh, towards Mexico, that's when they're losing all their numbers again. So basically what they're saying is the species is so resilient, they can explode out into, into the United States and they almost completely recover, even though they have these dwindling numbers in the winter wintering grounds. But they caution, because they say that this resiliency has its limits, because of course they, the species could never recover from zero, right? If, they, if there's none in the overwintering ground, they can't recover from that, right? But the, the point at which the threshold at which they're not going to recover from is certainly higher than zero, right? Maybe it's 100,000, maybe it's a million individuals, who knows what it is, and they don't know what it is. So they caution, they say this resiliency has its limits. So are monarch, monarch butterflies an endangered species now? I said yes, but also no. An international conservation organization has declared that the monarch is endangered. The federal government, which actually has power to protect the species, is still considering the science. And the science currently says this, the species seems really resilient, but it's, uh, it still may be in trouble. All right, question four. Does rearing monarchs help their population? I said, no, but you should still do it in some cases. And the root of this question is really in that in the Endangered Species Act we were just talking about. Because we, we, we kind of know what we're doing. If we find a struggling population of some animal, we know how to solve that problem, right? Because you know this endangered species, we've been doing this for a while, since 1973. I think we've saved 14 species, right? We're getting pretty good at it. We've kind of got a roadmap. So let's, let's go we'll walk ourselves through this roadmap. Well, first you find the adults, you find the adults. You figure out where they're laying eggs and you steal the eggs, you take the eggs, you put the, you take those eggs, you put them in a box into an incubator, you hatch the eggs, beautiful, cute little ugly ducklings here, right? Ugly um, uh, chicks, right? Then what you do is you find someone who's really good at making a puppet, really good at making puppets and someone who's willing to wear a puppet and you raise the chicks up. Right, it's really weird that I've never seen mom's wings, but whatever, that's fine, right? Then you take these, you, you raise them up to these awkward teenagers and you keep them in a box. So you, you keep them from dying, right? You protect them until they're adults, right? And then boom, presto changeo, population recovered, right? And I, I can tell you're thinking, you're thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be so easy. It's gonna be so easy because we don't even need the puppet. Monarchs don't care, they the monarchs don't care, right? But there's an issue. There's some hurdles that are posed by monarch biology. One is that they have a, a totally different reproductive strategy. So instead of sort of caretaking this one egg or two eggs, they have really low in, uh, parental investment and a ton of eggs. So they lay between one and 300 eggs and they just anticipate many of them die. Most of them dying in fact, maybe two or three live, right? That's very different. They also have my, uh, this weird migration that happens. Right, and of course those, those birds that I was referencing, they're, they also are, are at least partially migratory. Well, that migration is totally different from the monarchs because they have this intergenerational uh, migration where uh, the, for those that don't know, the individuals that leave Mexico are not the same ones that come back in the fall, right? In fact, they're the, I think the great, great, great grandchildren, it's four generations, right? So it, there's this really strange, uh, multi-generation migration that, that has to be dealt with. 
there's also some weird dangers that are that are different from a lot of the species that we've dealt with. So there's less poaching. There's different kinds of predation, mostly insect predation. There's also a disease that's pretty pretty bad. This I can't pronounce. Honestly, I cannot pronounce this uh, this name of this protozoan parasite. But luckily, in the literature, they just call it OE. So that's what we're going to call it. And that'll come up in a minute. The big thing is that these butterflies have a very strange response to, to captivity, different from what we're used to. So redder wings in monarchs are associated with better health and pointed wings are better for migration. And wild caught monarchs, which you can see on the right, have redder wings that are more pointed than ones that are reared, which you can see on the left. Wild monarchs are also stronger. So they have this little force meter and they, they lower the butterfly down and they let the butterfly sort of grab onto it and they lift up until the butterfly has to let go. And when they do this, the grip strength that captive, ind captive individuals show is much reduced compared to their wild counterparts. And they're not sure why, they're not sure why. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of cruise through a couple of these slides because th this is kind of a complicated thing to explain. But basically what's happening here is if you bring these monarchs indoors, they totally lose their bearing. They, they can't figure out where they are in the world. You try to release them and they're not flying in the right direction, right? Even if, you, if, even if it's just for a brief period, even if it's just for eclosion, whenever they go into a pupa, it, it really messes them up, really messes them up. And, we, and this is something that we're very curious that we have not figured out the mechanism behind. Um, I, I'm gonna also gonna breeze through this one. So, uh, there was a scientist who, uh, who reared a bunch of monarchs indoors and said, published a paper that said, well, they're flying south. And then someone else responded and said, OK, well, I, I looked at all the monarch releases that have happened in your area, which is Ontario, and they're all flying southwest. And yours are flying southeast. And if you know where Ontario is, it's sort of kind of next to New England. If you fly southeast, you, uh, you're flying out into the ocean, right? And so there was a big fight between, between a couple areas, a couple scientists that played out over five or six publications. And, and this is basically what happened, right? Uh, but it, it seems like they're, they're, that we've sort of come back to this conclusion that it really does mess them up uh, to have them indoors. Commercial monarchs, because there's been evidence that commercial monarchs actually make it to the wintering grounds, right? So they'll, uh, you'll tag a bunch of these commercial indoor raised uh, monarchs. And some of these tags are winding up in Mexico at the overwintering grounds. They thought, well, that must mean that they're okay at, at reaching Mexico. The thing is that they're actually probably just flying at random. It's probably totally random. So they might make it, some small percentage might make it, but it's not many. And, then, and actually they looked at the genetics of the commercial varieties and they have more genetics of their genetics in common with the non-migratory subspecies. So that's why, right? They're, they're flying at random because they don't have the instinct to migrate. They also have this issue with disease, this OE that I was telling you about. And this is not a picture of a monarch with disease because it's really gross. I didn't want to put a, a slide of it on my, or a picture of it on my slide. They just turned to a, sort of a, a black goop. It's, it's really gross, but it's fatal often, nearly always. And it's really, really virulent in rearing conditions. Um, and it's so virulent that even scientific labs that are dedicated to rearing butterflies that, for research specifically have issues with OE and they have access to things like autoclaves and, and other sanitary equipment, right? And even they have issues. So it's really difficult to deal with, right? And the, really the bad thing about this isn't necessarily that you're losing a bunch of caterpillars, right? It is actually that some small percentage make it, but they are still infected with OE and they can spread it out in the wild. And so you, you can end up killing a bunch of butterflies unintentionally. So it, looking at this sort of uh, from, uh, from afar, rearing, uh, rearing monarchs can cause issues with fitness, issues with migration and issues with disease. But, but you'll, as you'll remember, I said, but you should still do it in some cases. Well, what are those cases? Well, education, monarchs are really, basically unparalleled in their capacity to be ambassadors for the insect and science world. They're beautiful as caterpillars, they're beautiful as a chrysalis, as a pupa, and they're beautiful as adults. And they've captured the imagination of thousands and thousands of kids. And that's really valuable, it's so valuable. 
And you'll even find that some conservation organizations that used to sell uh, conservation kits, you know, where you could raise these monarchs indoors for con the, their conservation value, supposedly, are still selling those kits, but they're selling them for education. So I think that it's still very important to rear these. If you want to rear these with your, your grandkid or your, the neighbor kid or, or, or what have you, or in a classroom, that you should still do that. That's a great uh, instance to do it. And if you're going to do that, please watch this video series. It's from Iowa State. Uh, Dr. Laura Jesse Isles is the host. She does a fantastic job of sort of walking you through what, what the uh, container should look like and how to recognize OE and what to do if, you, if some of your butterflies get it and, and all these sorts of things. I think it's a four video or five video series and each one's like maybe three minutes long. Um, and I, if you are copying down this link, I, it's gonna be in the top right-hand corner in the next slide. All right, so does rearing monarchs help their population? Back to this question. No, but you should still do it in some cases. While it is probably not helpful to rear monarchs for the purposes of direct conservation, monarch rearing is an excellent and productive way to get young people interested in the natural world. All right, question five. Are my annual plants junk food for pollinators? And when I say annual plants, I, I'm what I've assumed that to mean is non-natives like petunias and that kind of thing. Right. And if you're if you're really there's there's a, a bunch of information in this that I'm actually going to go through pretty quickly and just summarize. And that's because Dr. Christina Grosinger did a fantastic presentation on this where she talks about mostly she talks about um, pollen nutrition. And if you're interested in what I'm talking about, you should you should watch this video. And just like last time, uh, that link is going to be in the top right hand corner over the next couple of slides if you want to copy it down. All right, so are my annual plants junk food for uh, pollinators? I said probably not, except in specific cases. To, to figure that out, let's, we have to uh, answer a couple of questions. So what do pollinators need to live? Well, they need nutrition for growing their, and maintaining their bodies, and they need energy for living. And what do non-native annuals have to offer? Well, they have biomass, they have nectar, they have pollen. Of course, they have other things, but we're, we're, we're being simple here, we're simplifying. So let's look at biomass first. So plants go to great lengths to keep their leaves from getting eaten. And this causes a kind of arms race with insects. So they, they pack their leaves with poison so that the insects can eat them. But the insects wanna eat, and over evolutionary time, these two go back and forth where one is filling their leaves with more and more poison, and the other one is, is finding ways, creative ways to deal with all this poison, whether it's enzymes or, or some kind of physical strategy, but they have this arms race that goes back and forth. And what this means is that insects that eat vegetation are typically confined to a small number of host plants with which they have evolved, right? And this also means that native insects uh, are often confined to native host plants, right? With, with some exceptions, not very many, but some exceptions. So this means that our non-native annuals probably are, are not providing biomass, right? So we can cross biomass off. So let's look at pollen. And I, I'm gonna uh, cite Christina's presentation here again, because she really goes into pollen nutrition and I'm only gonna sort of gloss over it, right? So please watch her presentation, it's very good. Pollen is high in nutrients. And those nutrients, as it turns out, are variable by plant species. So does this matter? in terms of whether or not this pollen is, is quote unquote junk food. Well, honeybee colonies, we know are healthier when they have access to diverse pollen resources, right? So, and this, this makes sense. It's kind of like a balanced meal. You know, we, we have peanut butter and jelly sandwich, the wheat and the bread and the peanuts, the legume have uh, overlapping uh, protein, amino acids, right? So they, they form a, a balanced meal, complete protein. And it's the same principle likely for these honeybees, right? Furthermore, we're, we're starting to think that maybe some bee species have certain pollen preferences. So they, they prefer pollen with a certain proportion of nutrients. So maybe this butterfly that we have, or excuse me, this uh, bumblebee that we have in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen might really like uh, fatty pollen, right? It, it only likes fatty pollen, right? And then something like this helictid over here on the, on the bottom left, it might really, really like a high protein pollen, right? So some bees 
may prefer pollen with certain nutrient proportions. And Christina goes into really, uh, really great detail in her presentation uh, about this our particular thing. The thing that, we, that may be the case is that not all bees prefer the same proportion of nutrients. So like I said, the, the bumblebee likes one thing and the helicid likes the other, right? So that means that if that's true, what is junk food for one would be a balanced meal for another, right? So what this, what this means, oh, and, and we don't currently know the profile, nutrient profile of all pollen or the preferences of these bees. So what this means is that we can't yet make species specific statements about pollen, about whether or not one species pollen is junk food compared to the other. But what we can say is that more diversity is probably good. It's probably good, right? So pollen is probably, it's probably, if your non-native annuals are producing pollen, it's probably good. It's probably fine, right? So let's look at, look at nectar. Nectar is high in carbs, and it's low in nutrients. And we're gonna go really fast to this one because uh, we're gonna simplify a little bit, but for, uh, for purposes here, for bees, nectar is nectar. They don't care. And this makes sense because uh, they get their nutrition from pollinators, right? But for butterflies, there might be a little wrinkle here. There might be something interesting. So even though nectar isn't high in protein, it does have some trace amino acids. And these trace amino acids vary by species, uh, plant species. And we've known for a really long time, I think since the 70s, that high amino acid plants on average tend to attract more butterflies. And for the longest time, we had no clue why. Because these high amino acid butterflies were not getting larger. They, were, they didn't seem to be benefiting from this in any way. You know, they're done growing, right? Um, so we couldn't figure it out. Well, now we, we think we might have figured it out. We're not totally sure, but we might have. And what, what these amino acids might help with is actually reproduction. So if a, if a given caterpillar just doesn't get enough to eat, right? It's on some really low uh, quality food and it just can't get enough nutrition and it ends up being a really small little runty butterfly, like a really small butterfly, right? Smaller than the rest of its, the rest of its uh, kin, right? If this happens, it might be that they don't have very high quality eggs or very high quality sperm. And maybe it's the case, scientists are starting to think that maybe these amino acids are actually helping them, right? So they'll, maybe they'll build up some of these eggs and some of the, these uh, sexual reproductive organs with these amino acids. And that's why it's helping them, why they have this preference, but it needs more study. It needs more, this is something to keep an eye on. Uh, if, it, if this is the case, the benefits are probably relatively marginal. Because like I said, it's not, that it, it's not necessarily helping the healthy individuals, right? It, it's helping the, it's raising the floor, right? It's not necessarily raising the ceiling, it's raising the floor. All right, so what we can probably say, safely say, I think, that, it, that nectar is good, right? That these non-native annuals are offering good nectar. Well, what else is there? Production and access. So double flowering varieties, are sterile. Most of the time they're sterile. Um, and sterile flowers have no pollen or may have really reduced pollen. And sometimes they have reduced nectar. Um, it, but the thing is, even if these double flowering varieties have pollen and have nectar in abundance, you can't access them. The pollinators can't access them, right? And a lot of our cultivars that we've created for these annual plants, because they've been in production for a very long time, have things like this, because they look really cool. They look really interesting. Right, it, but this causes a problem for pollinators, and of course, just like with every other plant, these non-native annuals some produce more nectar than others. Right, they're just they just have more nectar. So something like salvia is going to have more nectar than something like a petunia. Right, and that's just that's just something you have to keep in mind when you're you're sort of answering these questions: Are my annuals okay? Right. So are my annual plants junk food for pollinators? Probably not except in some specific cases. Non-native annuals can't be host plants for native insects, but they can provide valuable floral resources if they are not cultivars that express deleterious traits like double flowering. And it, you know, if, you're, if you're really worried about this, if you want to circumvent the sort of uncertainty, you can plant native plants because if you're wanting to help native uh, pollinators specifically, we know for a fact that these plants, that native plants can support them because they were doing it long before we came here, right? 
So you can sidestep any uncertainty by just putting in native plants. That said, uh, th and this is actually something that uh, Christina in her presentation mentioned. So insects, um, it's important to keep in mind, they're not robots, right? I, I really like calling insects nature's, nature's widgets, right? But they're not actually little machines, right? They're not little robots. They do have some limited, limited agency. So if a, if a bee comes up to a flower and it, it gives them nothing, right? They, they, there's no flower, there's, there's no nectar, there's no pollen, then it's gonna fly away, right? Maybe it will come back once. Maybe it will come back once just to see if, the, if they, you know, something had came there before it. But it's, you fool it, fool it more than a couple of times, it's gone, right? It's not gonna come back. So if you have a bunch of annuals, um, if, you, if, you, uh, if there are lots of pollinators visiting your favorite annuals, they probably aren't hurting anything. These annuals, these bees, these butterflies are getting something that they like, right? And so you, should, you shouldn't have to be too worried about it, okay? All right, question six. Can I help pollinators if I can't garden or don't own land? I said yes, and the way that doesn't need a garden have just as much impact. But what am I talking about? I'm talking about community science. Community science can be done in place in not, they don't have to be done in your garden, right? They can be done in communal spaces and at special events and so forth, right? So if you're renting and you don't have the ability to put in a garden, you can still have a big impact on pollinators. Just find some community science to do. And these community science projects, they aren't just fun, right? They're not just for fun. They have a really substantial impact on science. So you can see that there, um, on the right here, we have somebody doing some community science, uh, marking butterflies. And actually on the left, they're doing that too. In the center, we have uh, actually my boss, Dr. Alex Thomas Three, doing a, a vegetation survey in her neighborhood, right? Uh, and she does have a garden, of course, but th this is, she's not currently surveying her garden, right? This is, she's just surveying her street. So these are things that you can do uh, without having a garden, right? And these do make really valuable contributions to science. And I'm actually going to use a personal anecdote to illustrate that. So if you look here on the left, we have uh, a map that shows where all of my field locations were for my graduate project, actually. So these are the fields that I went and visited and gathered data from, data from in 2019 and 2020. And uh, you know, I spent a, real, a lot of time, I had a lot of help. Some folks in Extension helped me. I had a couple of student workers for a little bit uh, that were able to help me. Uh, and I put a ton of work into this, right? 12 hour days in spring and summer, trying to get driving to all these fields and collecting all this data, right? We did, I did all this work and managed to have a huge study compared to a lot of the ones that had done, happened before it. I had 40 fields and we studied for two years. It was huge. And e even, though we're, we're, even though this is probably larger than most experiments, we're gonna call this standard. We're just going to call this, we'll call this standard science. What's achievable with standard science under the science, standard kind of science model? Well, what can community science do? What can community science do? This is what it can do, right? Look at the difference here. So this is 150 different locations that are associated with the iPollinate project, right? And instead of working like I did on the left here for 12 hours for spring and summer for two years, uh, these folks are putting in a uh, half hour a month, right? Tops, half hour a month. And it's this concept of, of many, uh, many hands makes light work, right? And scientists are starting to realize how valuable this kind of work is. Uh, the biggest, kind of breeze, breeze through this one too. Um, the biggest citizen science project out there is probably the Audubon Christmas bird count. Um, Last year, they had 70, almost 77,000 people participating. But because we have these projects that are so large, um, and we have a couple of these on the, in, in the insect world too, um, we're actually, we're getting pretty good at using community science data because it's a little strange. Community science data is a little strange. Uh, it's formatted differently. There's different kinds of errors, but we're getting used to it. And we have scientists who are dedicated, who have dedicated their lives just to working with community science data. And this work has, has meant that we've, we've done some real good science. In fact, one of the papers that I referenced during this presentation, the one that talked about um, the resiliency of monarchs, it's actually relied almost entirely on community science data. It relied on uh, monarch tagging and it relied on uh, monarch counts, butterfly counts that have occurred all across the country, right? So this does really impactful, important science. 
if you're interested in doing some community science yourself, we do have one here at the University of Illinois. Dipollinate, the operated, um, the data data operations are managed by me, but it's created by Dr. Harmon III, has three parts. First two parts, pollinator visitation survey and a monarch survey, they, those do require that you have a garden. So if you see in the, the upper left-hand um, picture here, this is the kind of garden you'd have to plant for that. But bee spotter doesn't require a garden. You can do bee spotter at any time that you want for, it, for as long as you want, anywhere, doesn't matter. Uh, and these have a relatively small time commitment, the, the top two ones, the eye pollinate, uh, pollinator visitation survey and the monarch, monarch survey. And the third week of the month, uh, at some point in there, you would do a couple observations, probably a half hour a month, maybe a little bit more. And it's for four, it's four months long. And so I, I encourage anybody that if you want to, uh, want to be a part of some community science to apply to this. Now, I'm working on getting the training up for this. It's not, probably not going to be up at least until Monday. So if you want to participate, at least bookmark this link and then try on Monday. Um, let's see, okay. so. Aaron, do we have time to uh, answer some of these pre-made pre questions, these pre-submitted questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, so the, this one came in, let's see. Are native plants the best use of sunny garden area, areas when it comes to, um, let's see. Are native plants the best use of sunny garden areas when it comes to pollinators or are annuals and vegetables helpful enough to warrant a spot in a yard with lots of shade? If you enjoy growing vegetables, I, I recommend that you use the sunny spot for vegetables. Uh, people who are engaged with their yard and engaged with gardening consistently are the ones that are making the best pollinator yards because they're out there and they're seeing where pollinators are going and they're able to make little changes in their yard to, to sort of maximize uh, the utility that pollinators can get. So I recommend that if you really want vegetables and it's going to get you out more, absolutely use that sunny spot for your vegetables. All right, what season is typically lacking in floral resources? That is early spring and late fall. But with that said, I think it is more valuable to have a consistent bloom in your yard than it is to have a bunch of blooms at any one uh, point in time. That's because a bee can go there and just knows it can sort of be, you can be on a schedule to just knows that there's something is gonna be in your yard at all times, right? And that's really valuable to bees, consistency. Uh, all right, talk about annual milkweed. So tropical milkweed, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the, the Latin name for it, but tropical milkweed, you should avoid it. It doesn't have the same seasonality as, as the milkweeds that we know here in Illinois. Uh, and it can throw off a monarch a, a sense of time. So it can basically like, oh, well, this is in bloom. I must have another month uh, before, I must have another month un until the winter comes here. And then winter comes into it, right? So these tropical milkweeds aren't great. Uh, and I, I think they're also invasive in some uh, tropical parts. I don't think they would be invasive here, but they are invasive in some parts of the country, I believe. And there's this question about um, newer flower varieties. Um, so I've heard this about the nectar too. I might refer this, uh, defer this question to Aaron because um, I don't know about like how long a flower has been in cultivation, uh, if that has an impact on it, whether or not uh, it provides nectar, but I do know about that a double flowering variety um, produces very little pollen or perhaps no pollen and that they, uh, you know, are inaccessible, right? Uh, so why does one area of your yard attract butterflies more than another with the same flowers? Uh, insects and plants are both extremely sensitive to microclimates, really sensitive to microclimates. And that the, these microclimates are, are really small, maybe not necessarily in size, but in difference, right? So one area of your, of your yard could just be drier, just fractionally drier, or maybe it receives fractionally less sun, um, or it might just receive wind in a, we in a weird way that makes landing difficult, right? The insects are small and they can sort of sense these things way better than we can. Um, you have to do some, some, some pondering and some experimentation, uh, and hopefully you can, find out a way to, to get the pollinators over there. Maybe you just need different plants or something like that. Um, how do I support local, uh, local native bees and raise honeybees at the same time? And this is actually a quote from, um, from Dr. May Berenbaum, rising tide lifts all boats in regards to this sort of perceived conflict between 
native bees and honeybees. They're all really desperate for floral resources. So if you can provide a ton of floral resources, you're doing good for both of them. Um, if you really want to target those native bees, you could do some, some cut stems uh, for nesting, right? Uh, all right, Aaron, I'll, I'll hand that back over to you, if that's okay. Did you want to answer that? The, did you have any answers on this, this newer flower varieties thing? Putting me on the spot. No, I don't. <laughs> I haven't heard that yet. So that's good to know, something to, to watch and pay attention to um, as we move forward. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Brody. That was an excellent presentation. Lots of really great research um, presented for everyone. I really appreciated um, the deep dive that you took on those questions. Um, as, as Brody um, flipped the slide here, we do have an evaluation. If you could just take a couple minutes um, to either scan that QR code, um, copy down that link. I'm going to try to get it in the chat, um, and we will follow up with an email to you all with this information as well um, following the webinar today. Um, just one note, we are hoping to reach back out to you um, about a year from now just to see if you've implemented um, any action from information that you learned today. So just um, that's a heads up that if we reach out to you um, and say, remember that pollinator webinar that you you went to? Um, this is your, your mental note that, oh yeah, she said we'd be reaching back out. Um, we do have a couple more minutes um, and we've had a couple really great questions that I want to um, ask Brody if we can um, spend a little bit of time um, looking at. 